What's up guys? We're gonna finish off chapter 2 of The Wizard's First Rule. The farther from the boundary and the closer to down they got, the better he felt. His plan had worked. Seeing no sign that they were being followed, Richard wished they could stop for a rest. As his hand was throbbing, but she gave no sign that she needed or wanted a break. She kept pushing on as if the men were right on their heels. Richard remembered the look on her face when he had asked if they were dangerous, and quickly rejected any thought of stopping. As morning wore on, the day became warm for this late in the year. The sky was a bright, clear blue, with only a few white, wispy clouds drifting by. One of the clouds had taken on the undulating form of a snake, with its head down and tail up. Because it was so unusual, Richard remembered seeing the same cloud earlier in the day. Or was it yesterday? He would have to remember to mention it to Zed the next time he saw him. Zed was a cloud reader, and if Richard failed to report his sighting, he would have to endure an hour-long lecture on the significance of clouds. Zed was probably watching at this very moment, fretting over whether or not Richard was paying attention. The path took them to the south face of a small blunt mountain, where it crossed a sheer cliff face for which the mountain was named. Crossing the cliff near mid the trail offered a pan panoramic view of the southern fen forest, and to their left in cloud and mist almost hidden behind the cliff wall the high rugged peaks belonging to the boundary. Richard saw brown dying trees standing out against the carpet of green. Up closer to the boundary, the dead trees were thick. It was the vine, he realized. The two of them advanced quickly across the cliff trail. They were so clearly in the open with no chance to hide that anyone could spot them easily. But across the cliff, the trail would begin to head down into the heartland woods and then into down. Even if the men did figure out their mistake and follow Richard, the woman had a safe lead. Richard and the woman had a safe lead. As it neared the far side of the cliff face, the path started to broaden from its treacherous narrow width to a space wide, enough for two to walk side by side. Richard trailed his right hand along the rock wall for reassurance while looking over the side to the boulder field several hundred feet below. He turned and checked behind, still clear. As he turned back, she froze in mid-stride, the folds of her dress swirling around her legs in the trail ahead that only a moment earlier had been empty. There stood two of the men. Richard was bigger than most men. These men were much bigger than him. Their dark green hooded cloaks shaded their faces but couldn't conceal their heavily muscled built bulk. Richard's mind raced, trying to conceive how the men have, could have gotten ahead of them. Richard and the woman spun, prepared to run. From the rock above, two ropes dropped down. The other two men plummeted to the path, landing on their feet with heavy thuds, blocking any retreat. They were so they were as big as the first two. Buckles and leather straps beneath their cloaks held an arsenal of weapons that glinted in the sunlight. Richard wheeled back to the first two. They calmly pushed pushed their hoods back. Each had thick blonde hair and a thick neck. Their faces were rugged handsome. You may pass, boy. Our business is with the girl. The man's voice was deep, almost friendly. Nonetheless, the threat was as sharp as a blade. He removed his leather gloves and tucked them in his belt as he spoke, not bothering to look at Richard. He obviously didn't consider Richard an obstacle. He appeared to be the one in charge as the other three waited silently while he spoke. Richard had never been in a situation like this before. He never allowed himself to lose his temper and could usually turn scowls to smiles with his easy manner. If talk didn't work, he was quick enough and strong enough to stop threats before anyone was hurt. And if need be, he would
would simply walk away. He knew these men weren't interested in talking, and they clearly weren't afraid of him. He wished he could walk away now. Richard glanced to her green eyes and saw the visage of a proud woman beseeching his help. He leaned closer and kept his voice low but firm. I won't leave you. Relief washed over her face. She gave a slight nod. <coughs> Excuse me. She gave a slight nod as she settled her hand lightly on his forearm. Keep between them and don't let them all come at me at once, she whispered. And be sure you aren't touching me when they come. Her hand tightened on his arm and her eyes held his, waiting for confirmation that he understood her instructions. He nodded his agreement. May the good spirits be with us, she said. She let her hands drop to her sides, turning to the two behind them, her face dead calm, devoid of emotion. Be on your way, boy. The leader's voice was harder. His fierce blue eyes glared. He gritted his teeth. Last time offered. Richard swallowed hard. He tried to sound sure of himself. We will both be passing. He, he heart felt as if it were. His heart felt as if it were coming up into his throat. Not this day, the leader said with finality. He pulled free a wicked-looking curved knife. The man to his side pulled a short sword clear of the scabbard, strapped across his back. With a depraved grin, he drew it across the inside of his muscled forearm, staining his the blood red, the blade red. From behind, Richard could hear the ring of steel being drawn. He was paralyzed with fear. This was all happening too fast. They had no chance. None. For a brief moment, no one moved. Richard flinched when the four gave the howling battle cries of men prepared to die in mortal combat. They charged in a frightening rush. The one with the short sword swung it high, coming at Richard. He could hear one of the men behind him grab the woman as the man with the sword raced toward them. And then just before the man reached him, there was a hard impact to the air like a clap of thunder with no sound. The violence of it made every joint in his body cry out in sharp pain. Dust lifted around them, spreading outward in a ring. The man with the sword felt the pain of it, too, and for an instant his attention was diverted diverted past Richard to the woman. As he came crashing forward, Richard fell back against the wall and with both feet hit the man square in the chest as hard as he could and knocked him clear of the path into midair. The man's eyes went wide in surprise as he dropped backwards to the rocks below, the sword still held over his head in both hands. To Richard's shock, he saw one of the other two men from behind him falling through space too. His chest ripped him bloody before Richard could give it a thought. The leader with the curved knife charged past intent on the woman. He hammered the heel of his free hand into the center of Richard's chest. The jolt knocked the wind out of him and he flung him hard against the wall, smacking his head against the rock. As he fought to remain conscious, his only thought was that he had to stop the man from getting to her. Summoning strength he didn't know he had, Richard snatched the leader by his husky wrist and spun him around. The knife came around in an arc toward him. The blade flashed in the sunlight. There was a savage hunger in the man's blue eyes. Richard had never been so afraid in his life. In that instant, he knew he was about to die. Seemingly from out of nowhere, the last man with a short sword covered in gore smashed into the leader, driving his sword through the other's gut, slamming the wind out of him. The collision was so fierce it carried both over the side of the cliff all the way down. The last man howled in a cry of rage that ended only when they met the boulders below. 
Richard stood stunned, staring over the edge. Reluctantly, he turned to the woman, afraid to look, terrified he would see her gashed open and lifeless. Instead, she was sitting on the ground, leaning against the cliff wall, looking drained but unhurt. Her face had a faraway look. It was all over so fast, he couldn't understand what had happened or how. Richard and the woman were alone in the sudden silence. He slumped down beside her on a rock, warm from the sun. He had a powerful headache from having his head whacked on the wall. Richard could see she was all right, so he didn't ask. He felt too overwhelmed to talk and could sense the same in her. She noticed blood on the back of her hand and wiped it off on the wall, adding it to the red splatters already there. Richard thought he might throw up. He couldn't believe they were alive. It didn't seem possible. What was the thunder without sound? And the pain he felt when... When it had happened. He had never felt anything like it before. He shuddered, recalling it. Whatever it was, she had something to do with it. And it had saved his life. Something unearthly had occurred and she and he wasn't at all sure who he wanted to know what it was. She leaned her head back against the rock, rolling it to the side toward him. I don't even know your name. I wanted to ask before, but I was afraid to talk. She vaguely indicated the drop-off. I was so frightened of them, I didn't want them to find us. He thought maybe she was about to cry and looked over at her. She wasn't, but he felt that he might. He nodded his understanding of what she said about the men. My name is Richard Cipher. Her green eyes studied his as he looked at her. The light breeze carried wisps of her hair of hair across her face. She smiled. There are not many who would have stood with me. He found her voice as attractive as the rest of her. It matched the spark of intelligence in her eyes. It almost took his breath away. You are a very rare person, Richard Cipher. To his intense displeasure, Richard felt his face flush. She looked away, pulling the strands of hair off her face and pretended not to notice his blushing. I am. She sounded as if she was going to say something. She then thought better of it. She turned back to him. I am Caitlin. My family name is Amnel. He looked into her eyes a long moment. You two are a very rare person, Caitlin Amnel. There are not many who would have stood as you did. She did not blush, but smiled again. It was an odd sort of smile, a special smile not showing any teeth. Her lips were pressed together as one who would one would do when talking, when taking another into one's confidence. Her eyes sparkled. It was a smile of sharing. Richard reached behind, felt the painful lump on the back of his head, and checked his fingers for blood. There was none, though he had thought that by all rights there should have been. He looked back at her again, wondering what had happened, wondering what she had done, and how she had done it. There was that thunder with no sound, and he had knocked one of the men off the cliff, one of the two met behind him, and killed the other instead of her, and then killed the leader and himself. Well, Caitlin, my friend, can you tell me how it is that we are alive and those four men are not? She looked at him in surprise. Do you mean that? Mean what? She hesitated. Friend. Richard shrugged. Sure. You just said, I stood with you. That's the kind of thing a friend does, isn't it? He gave her a smile. Caitlin turned away. I don't know. She fingered the sleeve of her dress and she looked down. I've never had a friend before, except maybe my sister. He felt the pain in her voice. Well, you have one now, he said in his most cheerful tone. After all, we just went through something pretty frightening together. We helped each other and we survived. She simply nodded. Richard looked out over the fen. The forest where he was so at home. Sunlight made the green of the trees vibrant, lush. His eyes were drawn to the left, to spots of brown. The dead.
dead and dying trees that stood out among their among their healthy neighbors until that morning when he found the vine and it bit him he had had no idea that the vine was up by the boundary spreading through the woods he rarely went up into the fen that close to the boundary other people wouldn't go within miles of it others went closer if they traveled on hawker's trail or to hunt but none went too close the boundary was death it was said that to go into the boundary was not only to die but to forfeit your soul the boundary wardens made sure people stayed away he gave her a sideways glance so what about the other part the part about us being alive how did that happen galen didn't meet his gaze i think the good spirits protected us richard didn't believe a word of it but as much as he wanted to know the answers it was against his nature to force someone to tell something she didn't want to his father had raised him to respect another person's right to keep his own secrets in her own time she would tell him her secrets if she wanted to but he would not try to force her everyone had secrets he certainly had his own in fact with his father's murderer and with today's events he felt those secrets stirring unpleasantly in the back of his mind Kaylin, he said trying to make his voice sound reassuring being a friend means you don't have to tell me anything you don't want to and i'll still be your friend she didn't look at him but nodded her agreement richard got to his feet and his head hurt and his hand hurt and now he realized his chest hurt where the man had hit him. To top it off, he remembered he was hungry. Michael, he had forgotten about his brother's party. He looked at the sun and knew he was going to be late. He hoped he wouldn't miss Michael's speech. He would take Kaylin, tell Michael about the men and get some protection for her. He held out his hand to help her. She stared at it in surprise. He continued to hold it out for her. She gazed up into his eyes and took the hand. Richard smiled. Never had a friend give you a hand. Up before. She averted her eyes. No. Richard could tell she was. She felt uncomfortable, so he changed the subject. When's the last time you had something to eat? Two days ago, she said without emotion. His eyebrows went up. Then you must be very... You must even be more hungry than I am. I'll take you to my brother. He peered over the edge of the cliff. We'll have to tell him about the bodies. He'll know what to do. He turned again to her. Caitlin, do you know who those men were? Her green eyes turned hard. They are called a quad. They are, well, they are like assassins. They are sent to kill. She caught herself again. They kill people. Her face regained the calm countenance it was it had when her, he first saw her. I think that may be the fewer people who knew about me, who know about me, the safer I will be. Richard was startled. He had never heard of anything like this. He ran his fingers through his hair, trying to think. Dark, shadowy thoughts started to swirl again. For some reason, he was terrified of what she might say, but had to ask. He looked hard into her eyes, expecting the truth this time. Caitlin, where did the quad come from? She studied his face at a, a moment. They must have tracked me out of the Midlands and through the boundary. Richard's skin went cold and prickles bumped up along his arms in a wave that rolled up to the back of his neck, making the fine hairs there stand stiffly out. An anger deep within him awakened and his secret stirred. She had to be lying. No, no one could cross the boundary. No one. No one could go into or come out of the Midlands. The boundary had sealed it away since before he was born. The Midlands was a land of magic.